so great to have uh, our Liz Palmer uh, listening in. Uh, welcome. So I'm going to go through all of our, uh, go ahead and call to order. And so I just want to remind everybody that this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with Almaro County's continuity of government ordinance. And the meeting is will be recorded. Um, and so, and then I'm going to go ahead and just take a roll call. Nancy uh, contacted me earlier today, and she's actually going to take a, a hiatus of sorts. And but she hopefully will uh, join us back uh, in June. So, um, but she's got some things that she's going to work on. So uh, we will miss her, but look forward to seeing her again. Um, but hi, Michael. Emily, hello, uh, Leah, hello, and Kate, hello, hi Kate, how's it going? <laughs> and hi Bruce, and Lonnie is there, and Peggy. All right, so so great to see you guys, and I haven't heard from Kenan, so we'll have to check, check in with him. Um, but thank you to Carolyn for being here to help make this meeting possible. And uh, again, welcoming Liz. And I just wanna see uh, if we've got, and um, Rod and Maggie Walker, thank you so much for uh, joining us as well um, as an attendee. So if you, if you have any questions and, you know, Please go. Please make sure you raise your hand, or if you want to comment, we'd love to hear from you. So thanks for joining in. Um, so today, what we're going to do is uh, the first order of business before our uh, guests arrive at six o'clock is we're going to approve the agenda. Then we're going to approve the minutes, and then I would love to go ahead and approve uh, the annual report the 2020 annual report. So that would be great. So uh, is it, can I get somebody to make a motion to approve uh, the agenda today? I move adoption of the agenda. Wonderful. Second. And that is uh, Peggy seconded Peggy. that. And then we're just gonna go through the list and uh, I think I have to ask again, Michael, do you, Approve. Yes. Aye. Emily. Approve. Is that Emily? Oh, yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't hear who you were asking. Oh, yeah. And Leah? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kate? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Lonnie? Aye. And Peggy? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And then we'll go ahead and um, I hope everybody had an opportunity to look at the minutes from the our last meeting. And uh, does anybody have any questions or uh, additions to those? And if not, Mary, if not, I would move adoption of the uh, of the minutes. Wonderful. And a second. I'll second. Thank you. And we'll go through the roll again. All right. Michael? Aye. Emily? Yes. Leah? Yes. Kate? Yes. Bruce? Yes. Lonnie? Abstain. She wasn't here. Yeah. Okay. And then Peggy? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And we're going to uh, go ahead and move on to the 2020 annual report. And I hope everybody had a chance to uh, take a good look at that and uh, that we are all in agreement about uh, the goals, um, even though we are already a couple of months into 2020, but we've been working on those goals. And uh, you know, I have tried to highlight the main points of what we were able to accomplish last year in 2020. I know we're just two months into 2021 rather, but um, does anybody have any comments about that, comment about it before, um, 
or want to have any discussion. I can also share it on the screen if, if that's helpful. Just let me know. Does anybody want to look at it? It looked really good to me. Yeah, I like that it was short and clear and had content. Yeah, organized. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah, that's helpful, isn't it? I like bullet points. Yeah. All right. Well, um, would somebody like to move to approve it? I'll move that we approve it. Wonderful. And a second. a second. All right, great. And down the roll, we will go again. Uh, Michael? Aye. Uh, Emily? Aye. Leah? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bruce? Yes. Lonnie? Aye. And Peggy? Approved, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess Kim is going to package it up and send it on. And hopefully uh, it will be well received. Yeah, it's uh, it's scheduled for April, I think April 7th for the uh, consent agenda. Wonderful. And uh, so we have a, a little bit of time. Kim, would you mind uh, putting up the agenda? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And so we've completed the annual report and we have these focus areas that we are working on, although we were not, and none of, uh, we weren't, <laughs> we haven't figured out how to have a discussion about this outside of this meeting. And wondering if, uh, Kim, do you, if you gotten any insight and Liz I know is, in the meeting now, maybe she has some insight about how uh, we can have some conversations outside of this main meeting. Um, well, I, I'll start with what I, with, with what I know, which is going to be disappointing <laughs> because it's not much. Um, I, I just know that I, I followed up this week to to ask again about it, and uh, my understanding is that. Um, you know, CDD leadership and the county attorney's office and the executive's office are all having conversations about it. So um, that's what I that's that's what I know. Um, and so I've been told again, you know, coming soon. Uh, Liz has her hand raised. Would you like to unmute? Liz? Yes, I can. Um, so we had quite the long discussion at the board meeting about this. And um, what we decided, um, the board as a whole, uh, decided that um, we would do a pilot with three committees, one of which is yours, um, the SWAC, the Natural Heritage, and the Historic Preservation Committees would be able to have subcommittee, they may not be official subcommittees, but three people together to do it. There is an SOP that Emily uh, Kilroy um, will, uh, I'm not sure exactly how Kim will get this information, but Kim will get it. And um, you will have um, an SOP of what you have to follow and um, you will also have to follow all the FOIA requirements, but it will not require Kim or another staff person present as long as you can assure everyone that um, you can follow these procedures, okay? And, um, and basically it's, you, you can't write in the chat group, you have to have it, um, the short list is that you have to have this um, put on the calendar. The public needs to be able to join the uh, Zoom call if they choose to do so. And, uh, and um, like I said, no chat, it'll have to be recorded and it'll have to be sent back to staff so that it can be put up on the website. And, and so anyway, there, there's some standard procedures and I'm assuming that Kim will get that and give that to 
uh, you guys, and then you guys get to decide whether you can follow all those rules or not. And if you can, go for it. <laughs> so well, I, I just want to say thank you very much. I really appreciate that the board took the time to address this and um, to find a way that we could meet. And so it's very much appreciated. And I think it was, we know what we need to do that we can do it. I, I'm, I'm betting that you can. And uh, I'm just really grateful that you guys do the work that you do and you put the time into it. And, um, and so is the board and we do wanna follow the rules. Um, and not exclude anybody. However, uh, you, you have to continue to do your work. And it's extremely well appreciated that the, the work that you do. So um, that's, that's what we decided hot off the press just from yesterday, late afternoon. Okay? Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Liz, is that, Liz, is that based on two or more people meeting or three? It's based on, um, well, if, this is, gets stupidly complicated, but if you have a subcommittee that's an official subcommittee that you voted on to have, two can be a subcommittee. But if you never took the vote, uh, for instance, in the SWAG committee, we have subcommittees, but they were never voted to be a subcommittee. So there was never an official vote. So it's three people in those circumstances. Um, it's two people if you had an official vote to form a subcommittee. I know that sounds crazy, but that's, that's the rule we have to follow. Thank um, you. And um, so it just depends on what you all did in the past uh, to form your subcommittees. And going forward, don't officially form a subcommittee <laughs> is the message. <laughs> I, I think we were, you know, I don't know, I think we might have voted and we were just trying to be official and trying to do things the right way. Uh, and so can we just disband them? <laughs> I guess. I, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to, I'd have to talk to, we'd have to go back to the county attorney to see about that. Uh, in the SWAC committee, quite frankly, nobody really was sure if we had formed the if they had formed the sub if they had voted on them and one of the members Peggy Gilgis went back over the weekend and went back through all the minutes um, of when we just when they discussed the subcommittees and found there was never an official vote taken so um, so if you don't remember it might be valuable for you to go back and check and um, but um, you know if if you officially formed it we got to we got to follow the rules. So and, and official would be we voted on it. You voted on it. It's not just a discussion. Let's have a let's 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 have some subcommittees. You have to have voted on it is my understanding. OK, well, I think we'll have to do a little research then. Yeah. And if you if you're thinking about disbanding them it might be a little complicated right now. So I would just suggest you not Right, take us down that that road right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it got confusing enough uh, at the conversation uh, yesterday at the board meeting without going into disbandment. Um, so I have a quick question about this, Liz. Sure. Um, what's the rationale for recording? In that I understood the problem here was the burden on staff time, which is significant. And you know, I, I also feel for staff members who are asked to take any time out of their evenings. Um, managing recordings can be a, a fairly big pain, um, especially in a website that is hard to navigate already. Um, I'm wondering the rationale for that because it wouldn't be done if we were meeting in a room. Well, apparently, according to my understanding, there are laws now on the books for local government dealing with um, Zoom meetings. So okay. even though you would not have had to take minutes necessarily, complete minutes, if you were meeting in a room, this is something different for the wonderful world of Zoom. Interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, cool. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Liz. For uh, I was just going to say thanks, Liz, for working on this issue.
Um, you know, one suggestion that I have is um, if we can we can get um, a few members, like you know, at least at least one member trained on how to conduct these 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 meetings. Um, that's not Kim. Um, then we can use that as a as a way to conduct the the subcommittee the subcommittee meetings. Um, if that makes sense. It it does, and I my understanding is it's not hard. You just have to make sure you do everything. You know, yeah, that's you just that's need what to I make gather. Sure you've got the list in front of you, and that you've you know that you have uh, done completed the list. Okay. All right. We will look forward to the list and uh, work on fulfilling all the rules or following all the rules. Thank you very much to you and your colleagues for taking that up. I just want to reiterate that. That was that was great. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, I know that people didn't have an opportunity to meet, but just wondering if anybody had some something that they wanted to report either in the realm of education policy or wildlife corridors that you would like to report to the rest of the committee. I can say something about wildlife corridors and Kim should have some info too. She's, she's nodding. Um, I've gone through many databases that have and process data or information about ecological uh, priority areas, uh, important conservation areas, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, the, the terminology goes on and on and was able to pretty much narrow down to which database would be the most important for looking um, at potential wildlife corridors in Western Albemarle, well, in Albemarle in general, but I'm focusing on Western Albemarle right now um, to look at potential uh, quarters for wildlife to move into Shenandoah National Park under the assumptions that um, that's important from a climate change perspective. And um, anyway, I was, I've attended some webinars and things about where some of the data came from and it's layers and layers and layers and layers of statistical analysis have gone into many of these layers or many of the sub databases uh, that are actually all pretty much within the Natural Data Heritage Explorer system, the DCR system that I had always associated just with the Natural Heritage Committee. Uh, but anyway, there's many, many different um, sources of data and each source contains often numerous data sets. So it's really robust. And by using that and including turning on one of the layers of looking at already conserved lands, um, I've already identified like three kind of main potential um, parts of quarters uh, to look at the potential for preserving. So um, I'm just, I'm starting to put the pieces together now a little bit. And then um, I've also frequently come up with more and more questions and Perhaps at our next meeting, I might would love to get input from other people um, on a the only road crossing opportunity, potential road crossing opportunity that I've seen in Western Albemarle. Um, but it's it's nothing like the kind of um, opportunities that Kim has found along Highway 29 South, because as you get into Western Albemarle, you're in a more rural area, and so. The cars aren't moving as fast. The data is not tracked as well about um, animal collisions um, and the traffic patterns are just very different. So anyway, I, I look forward to hopefully getting some input and thoughts from you all um, at the next meeting on that. That's it. Thanks, Leah. It's pretty exciting. See that Lonnie? Yeah, I wanted to mention. Um, Go ahead, Lonnie. Yeah. Um, I want to mention in this subject of wildlife corridors, my wife and I spotted a mink on 810 between Crozet and Whitehall uh, that had been hit by a car. Um, and talking with some other people, they had seen them there too. That's the first time I'd ever actually seen a mink in Albemarle County, and maybe some other people have. Um, but someone I thought it was it's notable because it was near. A, yeah. I was going to say someone recently posted a picture. It was near a stream. Facebook. Yeah, it was alive though, but anyway. 
Go ahead, sorry. I, I saw one I actually took a picture just half a mile from my house on Jarman's Gap Road, which goes by Child's Peach Orchard. And I- Yeah, that's probably that, my wife. Oh, that's- Well, no, this was a different one and a different mink. And I was like, is this a mink? Surely this oh, okay. can't be a mink because I had gotten information from some mammologists asking what are some of the common species, common mammals that we might find, you know, in Western Albemarle or in Albemarle County in general. And they had mentioned the least tailed weasel. So I'm like, is this a least tailed weasel? They'd never mentioned mink. So then I look it up and find out there's two species of mink um, potentially in our area. So I was, yeah, like you, Lonnie, I was like surprised. I had no idea they were around. And if they're getting hit on rural roads, because 810 is very rural too, then you've got to wonder how many are there. Well, I can provide a quick update on the work that's happening in Southern Albemarle uh, as well. And also really important, cool thing to mention is the General Assembly um, passed some legislation about wildlife corridors and incorporating wildlife corridor considerations into planning in the different um, agencies plans in Virginia. So that's a really important um, thing that's happened since we last met. Um, but I've been working also with, um, with Leah and, and PEC and VDOT and Wild Virginia. And we have um, been looking at uh, the crossings in Southern Albemarle and um, the uh, Bridget from VDOT and I have set out some camera traps at the five priority sites that we're monitoring now to get a sense of what animals are currently using them and what the needs are. Um, and we've, we've already seen a lot of observations just from looking at tracks of <clears throat> where deer are going halfway uh, across 29 and then going up into the median, mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously a problem for collisions. And, um, and just a lot of other interesting observations on tracks of muskrat and uh, other small mammals. Um, bobcat definitely and and foxes using these underpasses so it's it's interesting and we'll see what we get on the camera traps but it will be good to have real um, systematically collected data on what's using these crossings and then uh, we are hoping to also develop a survey and maybe even an app for um, uh, folks to use to re record uh, collisions and roadkill so that we can get a sense of where animals are moving um, in 29 particularly, but also, you know, in the areas Leah is talking about and throughout the county. So if we can do that, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity for citizen science to get involved and provide us with real um, good data. Lonnie. Lonnie, do you still have your hand raised? Yeah, Kim. Um, I, I was wondering about the app thing. One of the things that we had been doing, um, well, the, my wife and I did when we saw the main, we recorded it in iNaturalist. And so that might be at least one interim thing that people can do if you see species of note that are hit by cars, the bobcats or uh, other things, maybe um, take a picture in iNat and, and post it up there. Um, it might be, if you're a cat, capturing um, trail or past crossings, maybe those might be good INAT observations as well. We could even make like an INAT project out of it. Emily, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that um, yeah, I stumbled across and I'll, I'll have to find the exact link, but um, I was looking into that kind of thing and there is a, um, there is an existing app of sorts. It's actually weirdly um, out of Austria, um, but, but it, there are some observations, they were a few years old, but there are some observations of roadkill on that particular app for our area already. So there is, there is something out there that is designed for and I haven't looked in it at it beyond that to like test it out, but I will find the um, I'll find the link and and share it with you, Kim. Uh, 
Yeah, that would be great. That that sounds good. I think I think it would be it would be good to have a tool like that throughout the county. Um, I, I think for for the area in the Southern Albemarle Mountains with 29, we're looking at having a more specific methodology of right. having a certain stretch of road at maybe even at a certain time of day. So there would be more specific criteria around it to start to really focus on what we're interested in in that particular area. But I think, uh, you know, for some of the areas that Lee is interested in and throughout the county, just to get a sense of where wildlife are moving, I think would also really be useful to have a, um, a more general tool that anyone could use. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think a specific uh, set of criteria for monitoring 29 would be good. So, and I'd love to see the app too, Emily, just for curiosity. Yeah, yeah I was just, I was like, what? There is such a thing. <laughs> but like I said, it's from Austria, but it covers anywhere that wants to use it. So nice. Look at it. Um, I also have another update, but I didn't know if Kim was done with her updates. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Go ahead, Emily. All right. Um, my update is sort of wildlife quarters slash um, important sites, which is that um, this past weekend with the warmer weather and the rain was the right um, conditions for salamanders to start migrating. Um, unfortunately, I think most of them probably went in the middle of the night on Sunday, like after uh, Saturday after midnight. But I was out monitoring um, both on Friday evening for a few hours until we decided it was too snowy and too cold and they weren't going to come out. And then again, on Sunday, I spent about six hours out there. Um, so um, report is basically that there was a um, some people who went to the Rio Mills side and the pools were just hopping with life. Um, really, really great stuff. Um, you know, I think they had fairy shrimp and different isopods and um, lots of marbled salamander larvae and adult um, adult uh, spotted salamanders. Um, so that was exciting. On my side, I was on polo grounds. I was monitoring the tunnels and boy, it was a lot of walking back and forth, looking, 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 but um, persistence paid off in the sense that I finally did see one that came down the hill um, and successfully took a couple of hours of it would hide and then it would move and then it hide and move, but it made its way on its own along the guide wall and into the tunnel. Um, and so, you know, at least one, um, one bit of data that suggests that they are going to successfully use the tunnels, but you know, that that's just one salamander. We're hoping to collect more data when we can, but it's exciting to, exciting to have those in place. As someone yeah, that, that is a lot exciting. of weekends out there, I'm really excited to hear that one made it through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been here for like six hours. Thank gosh, I saw one that went through and I got a little video of it like going through and it's really great because it's not a great video. It's just my phone, but like as it's going through, all of a sudden you hear kathunk, kathunk, which is the car tires going over the tunnel at the same time the salamander is underneath it in the tunnel and I'm like yes one saved so yeah it, it's sounds, exciting to see the stuff come to fruition that sounds like a great promotional piece with the kathunk kathunk right <laughs> so were there others going on the sorry Lonnie I didn't hear their whole were there others going on top of the road or Oh, sorry, were there others still going over the road or just? Um, we did not see any didn't... unfortunately Sunday evening was really um was really just misty and the rain didn't really materialize. And so um, I really think that a lot of them had migrated the night before because after midnight, it was a nice rain, um, but I was not out there after midnight. Um, so I didn't, I didn't see them. Um, there hasn't been another night that looks promising. So I cannot say whether any went over the road um, at this time or not, but it's a pretty, I mean, if you haven't been out there, it's like sort of like a, almost like a quarter pipe of one of these like a massive pipes. And so it's kind of like this. And so the salamander comes to this guide wall. I mean, it can't possibly go up because it like even turns back. It's not even just like climbing straight up something. So, I mean, unless they, unless they went around the ends, um, you know, and the ends are pretty far into the spaces where historically we have not seen so many migrating. 
um, you know, so um, it, it, it would be pretty hard pressed to do it. And as it comes along the guide wall, like the tunnel, the tunnel wall sort of sticks out so that as it's going this direction, it sort of hits the tunnel wall, you know, and has to make a choice which way to go. And obviously it wants to go towards the pool. So it takes that turn and was just in the tunnel. So that's what I can tell you. Hopefully will be more data either later this year, but we might that's pretty have cool. it's missed most of the migration. We will be out there next year and years after um, continuing to collect data. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. It's also that. really exciting about. Yeah, that's also very cool about the fairy shrimp. Um, that's the first I'd heard that there were fairy shrimp in those vernal pools as well. Yeah, I haven't There's confirmed that, but great Devin, documentary out there Devin that I can. Um, Sorry, Lenny. Yeah, Devin. Yeah, Devin great, was the one who said he saw yeah. it. Yeah, there's a great fairy shrimp documentary out there. It's it's a little weird because the guy is really super excited about fairy shrimp, but um, it was actually made from a local a local guy in the valley, and so I can send that out if anyone hasn't seen it before. It's like. Um, secret pond or something you probably saw it emily before but it's um it's an interesting video it's like the the, the camera work is really good i was going to say is it stephen david johnson he works at um eastern mennonite and just has fabulous photography and videography of of things in pools um the vernal pools he usually is up in the and uh, george washington national forest or something but um yeah he does fabulous work I think it is, and it is amazing. That, I'm, yeah, that I'm gonna, name doesn't sound familiar, but. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and um, just, we have our guest speakers have arrived. And uh, before I introduce them, I just also wanna recognize that we have a couple um, attendees, Ruth Douglas and Nicola McCoff. And so thank you for you guys for joining us and please uh, feel free to raise your hand. I don't, I don't know if somebody did want to speak, but Carolyn can certainly unmute you so that you can join in. But um, it's a real pleasure uh, to see Michelle McKenzie. Hello, Michelle, <laughs> um, who is the manager over at Bel Air CSA. And uh, she's been working with the uh, Virginia Hi, Wildlife. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so so glad to have you. But so she's been working with uh, the Virginia Working Landscapes, and then we also have Amy Johnson uh, and Charlotte Lorick as well. And thank you so much for coming to speak with us. I've been so excited about the work that you guys are doing, and really excited that you're working here in Almaro County, and we would love to spread the word about the great work that um, you guys are doing. So uh, welcome and thank you for coming. And I'm not sure how, how we would like to proceed. I don't know if you have like a, a presentation and we'd love to hear your overall program and also love to hear from Michelle about um, her experience and the data that she was able to get um, from your um, scientists going in and working on that property. Sure. Um, well, thanks everybody for having us. Uh, we're thrilled to be here and, and we've been trying to do a lot more work in Albemarle County over the last couple of years. So it's a great opportunity um, to meet you all. My internet is a little bit funky, but I'm on the phone Zoom. So my voice shouldn't cut out, but my video might. <laughs> um, so hopefully it doesn't cut out mid blink or something, but wouldn't be the first time. Um, so Charlotte and I, um, I, did, I did prepare a, a brief presentation just to go over our program, some of the research we're doing, and then Charlotte's gonna go into a little bit more detail about our biodiversity surveys using Bellar Farm as a case study. Um, and then we'd love to pass it over to Michelle and hear about her experiences. And, um, and then we can just open it up for discussion. So does that sound okay to everyone here? That sounds okay, great. Great, perfect. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Let's see. And make sure that everybody 
Can everyone see my screen? Maybe I can get a thumbs up. Perfect. All right. Um, so good evening, everybody. I'm Amy Johnson. I'm the program director for Virginia Working Landscapes. And then also here with me is our program coordinator, Charlotte Lorick, who, who worked with everyone on this committee to set this whole thing up. So tonight, we've been asked to take about 20 minutes, I think, to give you just a brief overview of what we do. Uh, I'll share some best management practices for conservation that we've uh, developed through some of our research. And then Charlotte will just go over briefly our biodiversity surveys, um, how we work with local farms, and then hopefully we'll hear some more information about Bellar Farm. So just a, a brief introduction to VWL. We're a Smithsonian-based program that brings together scientists, landowners, citizen scientists, and regional partners to study and promote the management of Virginia's landscapes for native biodiversity. So our mission is much like the Smithsonian's at hand. We prioritize the increase and diffusion of knowledge, and then we use science to address one of the Smithsonian's grand challenges which is to understand and sustain a biodiverse planet. And while we're part of this big global institution, um, we anchor our research right here in the local Virginia community by conducting on the ground research on properties in our ever expanding survey network throughout the region. So we started out with 12 properties in 2010 and have since worked on close to 200 um, by the end of last year. And our survey efforts have covered more than 80,000 acres across a 16 county region you can see here on the screen that's predominantly privately owned. So I think uh, we have done some work in Shenandoah National Park and a couple of public land properties like Sky Meadows, um, Shenandoah River State Park, but the majority of those 80,000 acres we've worked on are privately owned. So with only a small team of core staff, uh, Charlotte and I make up two thirds of the core staff of VWL. Uh, we can't talk about our program without acknowledging the importance of our collaborators to keep the program thriving. So uh, from more than 200 landowners who provide us land access to do our research, uh, the local NGOs that put on outreach events with us and our citizen scientists that help us conduct research in the field. And then even our research fellows from partnering universities, partnering universities that help us um, expand our research programs. So from our point of view, conservation is really only successful when we work together. So we rely very heavily on this network to help push our efforts forward. So in addition to research, we also uh, do a lot of outreach and education events, which I'm sure you will have guessed have been uh, a lot of them have been put on hold the last year or so due to COVID, unfortunately. So this year we're going to be picking up the speed on, on more virtual webinars and such. Um, but today I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the research that we're doing so you can get a better understanding of how we work with our private landowner community to continuously build knowledge. So our research includes our foundational biodiversity surveys that have been going on since 2010. And these really help us to develop focal projects based on questions that arise from these surveys or species of interest. Um, and Charlotte will tell you a little bit more about that. And then we also work closely with partners who seek out the vast network of private lands that we have um, through our study region to help answer some of their research questions. So there's projects that we lead and then there's other projects that we don't necessarily lead, but we help uh, connect the researchers with the landowners. But in general, our research aims to enhance our understanding of our local ecosystems, to generate information that can help inform best management practices. We really try to harness the expertise of re research partners. So not only within the Smithsonian, but with all of our partners that work here in the region through these collaborative projects. And then we really aim to engage the community in conservation science. So for example, um, a lot of our research looks into the status, restoration and management of native grassland communities. So across North America in general, 99% of our native grasslands are, are gone. And I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, and while we're out in these 
rural areas, it, to me, it often seems like, well, we're surrounded by grasslands, but the majority of grasslands that occur here in the eastern U.S. are dominated by non-native grasses, like tall fescue or orchard grass, like you see here on the left. So these grasses were brought here by the Europeans to support grazing livestock, and they outcompete our native grasses because many of them are cool season grasses, meaning they grow well in cooler weather. So here's just a, a chart that shows when our cool season grasses are really peaking in those early months. This is why Virginia is so green uh, come April. And, uh, and since they outcompete these native grasses, um, they, they don't really allow our native grasses a chance because our native grasses tend to grow in the warm season, which is why they're called warm season grasses. So in order to restore the grassland plant communities native to our landscapes, there's been a lot of interest in our landowner community to establish native meadows through planting and management. Um, this practice has multiple ecological benefits. It improves habitat structure. It increases shrubland bird abundance and diversity. It provides excellent cover year round for wildlife. It increases insect and pollinator diversity. I mean, it goes on. Um, however, they're incredibly complex ecosystems. And with that comes a lot of complexity in the establishment and management of these meadows. And so to address knowledge gaps associated with uh, native meadow restoration and management, we're currently conducting some experimental trials with uh, the Clifton Institute, as well as Oak Spring Garden Foundation um, to document outcomes associated with different native wildflower establishment and management methods. And we're incorporating both organic and non-organic methods to do so. So right now we're in our second year of preparing these experimental fields and we're already learning a ton. Um, I wish we had an hour to talk to you about all of these things, um, but we're, we're learning so much that Charlotte is scheming this follow-up study to focus solely on organic methods to establish and manage these fields as we've just had a lot of interest even in the last two years from our community to shift more management practices um, to those that don't require the use of chemicals. And there's surprisingly very little research on this. Um, another practice we're starting to research more is regenerative grazing, which is known to rehabilitate and benefit agricultural ecosystems. So by mimicking by, uh, historic bison herds, like rotating across the landscape, regenerative grazing practices are shown to restore the soil biodiversity, they increase organic matter, sequester carbon, improve water quality, and can increase profitability. However, here in eastern grasslands, there is very little information regarding how these practices influence nesting success of grassland birds. So grassland birds have declined more so than any other group of birds in North America. And because many of our grassland birds, you'll see there's a meadowlark off in the distance perched on, on a fence post there, they nest directly on the ground in grasslands. So any disturbance during nesting season can either destroy the nest or cause uh, the parents to abandon it. So the periods of rest that are incorporated into rotationally grazed systems often used in regenerative grazing can potentially give ground nesting birds ample opportunities to hatch their young. And that can take up to six weeks from the beginning of nest building to the time when they, uh, the hatched young actually fly on their own. Now, alongside that, we also have a growing network of landowners interested to know how they can alter their mowing schedule to help these grassland birds. So the timing of management of these fields is incredibly important for a variety of reasons regardless of a field being a native meadow or, or a cool season hay field. So by altering the timing of field management, you can better support nesting birds. You can increase insect abundance. Um, our research has shown we can provide ample winter resources to wildlife by altering the timing of management. Uh, we can increase flower availability to pollinators. We can manipulate the vegetation community. Lots of benefits from just switching up how we or the timing of when we're managing these fields. So just as an example, this field on the left is a hay field 
um, that we snapped a photo of on June 3rd in 2020. So you'll see, let's see if I can get my mouse on it right here. There's an Eastern meadowlark that has plopped its nest right in the center of the field. This is prime nesting habitat for this species. This, they, they love just these wide open grasslands. So when we came back to do a nest survey several days later, that field had been hayed and the nest had since hatched out and the nestlings had been destroyed. So this is an all too common ending for grassland birds. And re research has shown that mowing before June 15th can result in over 95% mortality of nestlings. So this is a huge contributor to grassland bird decline. So by delaying the timing of haying or even altering the dates, um, you can provide more opportunities for these species to thrive. Um, however, for working hay farms, which is a lot of what we have in our region, this isn't always possible. So right now we're working with hay farmers in the region to come up with a harvest schedule that works for both farmers as well as birds. Uh, and then we're also working with local partners at the Piedmont Environmental Council to help develop incentives for farmers who are interested in creating grassland bird nesting habitat. So this is a study um, that we started in 2020 uh, in collaboration with American Farmland Trust. And we actually had local producers co-design the study with us um, to optimize opportunities for both the farmers and the birds. We, we piloted this study, so we're looking at both regeneratively grazed fields as well as hay fields um, on four farms in 2020. And in our first year, we monitored over 100 nesting territories of grassland birds. And this includes um, eastern meadowlark, grasshopper sparrows, and bobolinks. That's what's pictured here. These are bobolink eggs on the ground, um, nestlings that are just a couple of days old. And the, this is a day before they fledge, they're just completely overloading the nest. Uh, so results from this study will eventually help us better define more regionally relevant recommendations for bird-friendly agriculture. So as an example of that, we, we already have this mowing calendar that we created. It's available on our website and it's been created based off of our past research and what we're learning on a continuous basis through through the work we're doing every summer. So as we continue to learn more from this research, we will constantly be refining this calendar uh, to reflect the needs of both the farmers as well as the birds. So since we're on the subject of best management practices, I, I did wanna to touch on some supplemental structures and planting um, because I, I know that there was some interest to learn more about things that we promote through our program. And these are things you can add to a property of any size and, and see immediate benefits, including increased wildlife viewing opportunities, nesting opportunities, pest control, increased vegetation structure for wildlife, and then as a result, increased species diversity. So this is a field uh, that we've conducted several research projects at, and I'm always in awe um, at how a few supplemental additions can really boost biodiversity. This is in Washington, Virginia, up in Rappahannock County. So for one, um, mowing a path through the meadow not only gives you an up close and personal experience in nature, um, but a lot of the birds actually enjoy foraging in the short grasses. They like having this mosaic of tall and short grasses. Um, and this landowner not only leaves dead trees up, but he actually erects dead trees from the forest and, and puts them in the middle of fields as perches for birds. So this attracts species like red-tailed hawks, it attracts American kestrels, it attracts bluebirds, and then he enhances this habitat for the latter two by adding these kestrel boxes as well as bluebird boxes for nesting. And then um, also nesting boxes for wild bees. He's got plenty of these situated throughout the property and um, I think there's plenty of resources for creating these online. Um, now, if, if the property that you are visiting or that you have has existing barns or silos, um, these are often the homes of barn swallows, chimney swifts, or even barn owls. Um, and these are all fabulous and free pest management specialists. So we really try to sell these to farmers that you want these species around 
So encouraging the maintenance of those structures as much as you can. And then uh, finally, you can add structure and cover to an open landscape like this by creating bush piles, or more importantly, planting native shrubs, like this is a, a button bush. Uh, these provide excellent cover habitat for rabbits, for prairie warblers, bobwhite quail, um, and not to mention great food for pollinators. Uh, so Charlotte has some really great resources about uh, different native plants and what types of species they can support. Um, so one question we get a lot is, well, does this only pertain to large meadows like this? A lot of the work we do is on very large properties, um, but we say absolutely not. Uh, we have colleagues at the Smithsonian that, that just published a study showing that urban backyards need to consist of at least 70% native plants in order to support sustainable bird populations. So above all, you know, we promote no, no matter where you are, going native can go such a long way. So really take the opportunity to inventory um, what's in your yard, get rid of those invasives and uh, go native as, as much as you can. So that's a window into some of the research that we do and how we use results to help support landowners in making decisions about management strategies, um, whether it's to support pollinators or, or vibrant native plant communities, bird-friendly agriculture. Um, and we think it's really important to constantly be involving the community in not only the design, but the implementation of, of these research projects to make sure that we're addressing knowledge gaps that are relevant to the folks uh, that we work with. So some other ways uh, people can get involved is to volunteer your properties for biodiversity sorry, biodiversity surveys, which Charlotte will talk about in a little bit. Uh, volunteering as a citizen scientist, we've trained more than 300 citizen scientists in our monitoring protocols. Um, we also have a monthly newsletter. So if you have landowners in Albemarle County that are interested in conservation, um, this is a great newsletter that comes out once a month. So we're not flooding your inboxes. But what I love about it is um, for us, it serves two purposes. So for one, um, it provides our interns and fellows uh, with opportunities to enhance their science communication skills. So every month they pick a recent scientific article that's come out um, that discusses research to do with conservation science or, or land management. And what they do is they summarize it in a simple paragraph. Right now they're actually summarizing them in point form and just noting the most important points from the paper and why they're relevant to our landowner community. So second, it brings our community one step closer to brand new science, like as it's emerging and provides uh, our, our network with new knowledge on conservation practices every month. Um, so you can sign up for this newsletter on our website, and then it also uh, has lists of events and, and resources that we're releasing each month. This past year, um, I gave a TED Talk on bringing birds back. So this is a great resource for giving people simple, easy things that they can do on their properties to help bring birds back. It focuses on farms um, as case studies. Uh, for a lot of these practices, but at the end, it also goes over several practices that you can take on, even if you're a small landowner. So that's available online as well. And then I always put this in all of my presentations, but but just so all of our network knows, our, everything that we do is um, is done through grants, donations, and community support. So despite the fact that we are part of the Smithsonian. Uh, all of our projects, our staff, our field checks are, are supported through grants. So we're constantly looking for opportunities to co-develop grants with partners in the region that have similar conservation goals. Uh, so keep that in mind as, as you're considering um, needs for your county and potential opportunities to partner. So that's um, all I have for you. This is my contact information. If, you, if you'd like any information about the things I just mentioned, and I'd love to just pass it over to Charlotte and give her an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the biodiversity surveys um, and our work at Bel Air Farm. I can go ahead and get started. I 
I'm still seeing Amy's screen, but um, hopefully you all can hear me. Yes. I think, okay. I think I. <laughs> Maybe that's just my computer. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you again, Christine, for, for inviting us. Um, you know, we're excited to talk about the program and, and get more people involved. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to speak very briefly about our biodiversity surveys, um, which is perhaps what we're most well known for. Let's see. Um, what happens if I share my screen too? Um, Hopefully you all can see this. I'm not even gonna make it an active presentation format. I'm just gonna leave it as is, but, um, but yeah, so Amy, you know, touched upon our grassland bio biodiversity surveys. And this is really, um, this is really what got Virginia Working Landscape started. So in 2010, a land, the landowner community around SCBI came to researchers at the Smithsonian and, and really were requesting um, the researchers support them in conducting uh, studies on on their on local properties to understand how land management practices are impacting um, the native biodiversity because uh, really you know they're like we're doing all of these things on our property but we have no idea how it's impacting birds pollinators wildlife etc so that's really how the the biodiversity surveys were born um, through a community community engagement um, which was really nice and as Amy mentioned uh, since that was in 2010 since then we've really built them out every year we expand on our, our research properties um, and we've been working mostly on private lands um, uh, you know the majority of grasslands in our region are privately owned so it's it's really been wonderful to work with the, the private landowner community to actually get a real um, research and a real glimpse into what these grassland ecosystems in our region uh, what's going on in them so so for these surveys, we, um, I'll show the map here in a second, but essentially we're, co we're collecting the same data across you know, every property in every field that we survey. Um, and we're documenting bird species, uh, plants, pollinators. Uh, we take soil samples in, in each uh, survey site. Um, and then in addition to, to, the, you know, to the biodiversity information, we're also gathering information from landowners on um, how they manage their fields, uh, whether it's, you know, timing of haying or whether they graze the fields, and then also just the, sort of the recent history uh, of how these fields have been used. Um, and then finally, you know, we're documenting things like field size and, and structure, you know, how dense is the vegetation in those fields, how tall, as you can see in, in this top photo here, some of the fields are quite tall. Um, so, so we document all of that too, uh, to understand what the structure looks like. Because all of that information together um, really gives us a better idea of what's going on in these grassland ecosystems. And I'm just going to show you, Amy already showed this property, but you know, essentially um, every year we're trying to expand on the amount of uh, you know, the data that we have and the amount of properties we survey. Um, and you know, we're, we're located in Warren County, so you can see the bulk of our survey sites are there. But, we, we do our best to try and reach a 16 county region, which is huge um, for us, for a small team. But we do have our, our citizen scientists who've con who contributed to this research um, that we train every year and who, who essentially expand our team tremendously um, and help us get out in the field to more research sites. Um, so really, I mean, really what we're accomplishing with these, with these surveys I mean, it's twofold. We're we're gathering really important ecological information that you know we've we've been keeping in our growing database that we share with research collaborators, um, and that's helped to inform a lot of um, different publications. Um, and then also, it just helps to inform our different research questions and what what we're trying to understand about um, about our our region. And so recently, you know, we've published um, with some partners and colleagues of ours a a paper that used our you know, I guess 10 years now of, of grassland biodiversity information. Um, and it was all about ecological restoration and how different methods of establishing native meadows, um, how, how those different methods impact the persistence of the native meadow mix that was planted um, in addition to the persistence of invasive species and other, other species that were 
that were in that meadow. Um, Amy, uh, she, she conducted her PhD dissertation on grassland bird um, ecosystem or grassland bird habitat, particularly for overwintering birds and how um, different meadow or grassland structures um, and management timing impact the, um, the overwintering bird species in our region. Um, so, so it's really a growing database. Um, our goal is to utilize that database to inform science, to inform our colleagues, and to understand um, what's, you know, what's happening in our grassland ecosystems. And, you know, for example, um, Amy mentioning how many of the grassland bird species uh, as a whole, as, as an entire suite are declining. And so, you know, using this information, can this inform inform us as to some of the reasons, the main reasons why the, the, we're seeing these population declines. And then potentially, you know, how can we reverse those or help to reverse those? But really the other half of it, which I'm, you know, is, is really just engagement with our community. And so what's wonderful about these surveys is, you know, we're on the ground, but we're on the ground on someone's property. And um, more often than not, the landowners will join us on our surveys. They're very engaged in, um, in the data collection process and in understanding how we conduct the surveys, um, you know, asking questions about what we're seeing. And so it just gets the whole community, it gets the people who are really ultimately the decision makers when it comes to conservation practices, it gets them involved in um, developing research questions in, you know, understanding, you know, what we're doing and then also, um, you know, informing our research. So, um, so it's a wonderful partnership and and so, you know, ultimately we would love for, and, and we've seen it happening, um, for these biodiversity surveys to not only inform, you know, science and our research and publications, but also to inform management practices every day on the ground that um, people are using to, uh, to manage these fields. So I think I'll leave it at that. I, I did want to pull up, um, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. I don't want to... Um, steal too much of your thunder here, but I'm just gonna pull up really quickly um, the landowner report that we sent to Bel Air Farm. We, we, they were one of our survey sites last year. Um, and this is what we, we, we provide to landowners at the end of every survey. We're, we give them a, a list of all of the species that we documented on their property that year. And it's wonderful, you know, it can just be a tool. A lot of landowners um, are super engaged and knowledgeable about their properties. Um, but more often than not, we'll find some species that they might not, might not have known were, were using their property. So um, it's really fun. And Michelle can tell you <laughs> about her experience working with us. But I did want to point out some species that we found at Bel Air Farm that you know, were exciting. Um, Amy had mentioned Eastern Meadowlarks. And um, I don't think she mentioned grasshopper sparrows, but both of those species are grassland obligates and they nest um, directly in our fields. And so we're always, we're always excited to find, to find them on properties coexisting um, you know, with whatever management practices are being used at those properties. Um, but just having those on a list for a landowner, um, especially if they didn't know, you know, oh, I have grasshopper sparrows on my property, um, that can be useful information when coming up with management um, strategies for for managing a field. Um, we get a lot of questions about timing of mowing and timing of haying. Um, and so for, for landowners who have the luxury of shifting those dates or moving that around, um, you know, understanding that there are these birds that are actively using their fields uh, can be really valuable information um, and, and, help, and hopefully can help them to determine what the best timing is for, um, for, for management. And then I just, lastly, I just have to say the Northern Bob White, we're, we're always super thrilled to see those on properties because um, fewer and fewer of our surveys do we actually pick up Bob White quail, um, unfortunately. So um, Michelle, that's, that's awesome. Uh, we're really excited to see that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I'll stop there. I'll, I'll pass it to Michelle, but um, I did wanna mention, you know, Amy and I are here, ask us questions. We tried to keep it brief, but, um, if there's something you want us to go into more detail about, we're, we're happy to do that. Thank you. I think we will have some questions, but we'll, we'll hear from Michelle. Yeah, uh, thank you, Charlotte. And, um, and thank you, Amy, and thanks everybody. Um, my internet here at the farm is very rural. <laughs> so 
I'm going to leave my camera off. I wonder, can I share my screen with my camera off? I'm trying. Yeah. Um, great. Yay. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah, I, I just have a couple tabs, um, pulled up here and so one of the main things I wanted to kind of bring up, first of all, I just think this, this program is so amazing. As soon as I heard about it, I was really interested in, um, trying to see if we could do something like that on the farm. I've been, uh, working at Bel Air Farm for 10 years. Um, and one of the reasons why I stayed after so many years is just because it's a really incredible um, property. It has so many ecosystems on it and it's really, really a pretty incredible piece of land. Um, and it has a lot of bottom land along the Hardware River. Um, and so we grow vegetables. We actually, there are three farm businesses that work off of the property. There's a beef cattle operation. I manage the vegetable operation and there's a uh, sheep dairy as well. And so there are multiple different pasture types as well as annual vegetables going on. Um, and there's wooded acreage as well. So I have up here a map of this open area in the middle is roughly Bel Air Farm, um, although there over here um, where my mouse is, there's some wooded acreage as well and some wooded acreage south of the Hardware River. Um, but most of the area, the survey sites were right there, kind of right in the middle of the screen, one, two, three. Um, on our farm, we, were, we had three sites. Um, and so basically, you know, this uh, Virginia Working Landscapes project for me was a huge culmination um, and a journey for me personally. Uh, I had wanted to think about conservation more intense, intensely on the farm, um, intentionally, I should say, uh, for a long time. And I was assistant managing the farm um, around the time that I really started to pipe up about that. And the farm owner, um, Ms. Cynthia K. Davis, is a really wonderful person. And she is also interested in birds and uh, wildlife and that kind of thing. And so she was always very amenable to the idea. But there are a lot of voices in the conversation. It wasn't just me and her, there was my direct manager and there were the other managers of the other farm businesses. And we all kind of cooperatively use the farm uh, together. And so I just was having a lot of trouble like gaining political ground and like really um, kind of sealing the deal. We would all agree to certain mowing schedules and then the next year would come along and then all of a sudden the bush hog is on and um, I, I just didn't know uh, what to do with it quite. And it was becoming frustrating for me. But when I got work, Virginia Working Landscape involved, for me in my own personal story um, with it, that was kind of like the little bump we needed um, as a farm community, kind of like an authority figure saying, yes, these mowing dates, um, you know, this isn't just something that's coming out of Michelle's head. This is something that people are generally recommending. Um, and so basically it just kind of turned that last little corner that I, I just needed a little help with. And then now it just feels like we're all on board. It was no big deal. And we're just, we're, that's just gonna be like um, standard operating procedure from now on. Uh, so it feels really good. and. Not to mention the fact that the farm in general is just such a, an amazing place um, on its own that 
you know, that little stuff does go a long way. And I anecdotally, as a bird watcher myself, have, have seen an increase in all kinds of species. You know, I, I didn't used to hear the bobwhite and now I do. Um, things like woodcock um, and Wilson snipe. Um, and in addition to a lot of the breeding nesting birds like the meadowlarks and grasshopper sparrows galore, it's really hard to walk into, go down to our fields without seeing a grasshopper sparrow actually. Um, and that's something that I kind of describe here in this newsletter. So for us, you know, I've got a, I've got a farm business and um, I am able to use this project as kind of a talking point for our CSA members um, and really, it's something that people really care about and it really matters to them. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that we did it. And that's kind of like a, a side benefit. Um, this, this is a photo of like a wetland area. So before we started growing vegetables on Bel Air, um, Cine was leasing most of the land to conventional soy and corn, including this field. Um, and I remember, uh, back then in, you know, from 2011 to maybe 13, uh, they were still growing soy there. And this spot right here was just always just a muddy mess. It was never soybeans. It was always just a mud pit. Um, and for the last five years, we've had this field on, um, a one to two year, uh, mowing cycle. And so it's kind of just a permanent ecosystem. And then this is just one of our driveways. Our owner um, did another separate uh, meadow project along the edges of our driveway, and that's a big blackbird flock. Um, and then I also, you know, promote this kind of stuff on our uh, social media. This is our Instagram, and the photo in the middle here um, is that same. Vista, uh, but just right after a mow. So you can kind of see that um, there. And so, you know, people really love hearing about this stuff. Every once in a while, we intersperse um, something talking about pollinators or native species or the adjacent ecosystems. Um, and it's really part of our talking points for the farm business. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of my two cents about it, you know, and I really just appreciate that this program exists and we uh, were able to participate in it because it's it's done really incredible things for us. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I just want to attest that um, when I had received one of your newsletters and I saw the work that you were doing, it was just so exciting. And I think it's an important thing to be sharing uh, a different way of doing things and really spreading the word that way. And I'm just curious, what were the, the changes? Was it uh, mostly changing the date of the mowing? And like, do you have those hay fields? Were you mowing for hay? What were the things that made some of the biggest impact, do you think? Yeah, well, um, the breakthrough specifically that I was talking about was just kind of, um, in reference to a couple fields in particular that weren't, they're not used in an agricultural sense anymore. Um, they're, Cine likes them to be nice open fields um, for a nice vista. And they're too small to justify haying anymore. And, you know, putting anything on them is like chickens or pigs is gonna ruin the vista. And so basically those fields, for me, I was like, those are perfect contenders. There's no reason. You cannot justify the mowing with any agricultural reason. So this should be an easy sell. And it, it wasn't even that anyone disagreed with me. It was just these habits that people get in and it's just like, oh, I, I just, I mow the field in, in May. That's what I do. Like fresh cut grass, America. Like, and so I think that um, it was just kind of this, um, having, you know, an, an institution behind me really like strengthened 
that for me. And so specifically, and also, yeah, so I had done my own research about mowing dates and I had formulated something that was really, really not indifferent from what uh, VWL recommends, um, which is kind of like avoiding mowing um, kind of in the months of like May, June and July, essentially. Um, but I was just, I didn't have a high level of confidence. I was like, I just found this on the internet. Like, who am I to say that this is the rule? Like, and then, you know, you get imposter syndrome and that kind of thing. And it was just like, no, this is the standard. I feel confident in it. This is what we're doing. Um, and so that happened with that field. And then I'm, I'm really excited to kind of now that we have this study back, I think that the next step for us is taking this and thinking about it in terms of the fields that we are using agriculturally, specifically our pasture land. We have two species that we're grazing, um, that are grazing our fields. In the bottoms, we have cows, and in the uplands in the farm, we have sheep. And so um, I think that. I'm really interested to kind of talk with our partner farmers about that because, you know, I really just, I don't think that, um, I think that now I just have a very concrete idea of what the ask is. Um, it just kind of simplifies the whole thing and it's, it just takes all the mystery out of it. I think a lot of times when, when I would approach folks about this topic, um, it was like before they could even hear what I was asking for, they were like coming up with all these, like they, they were just afraid of what I was going to ask. But what I was going to ask is not that big of a deal. It's just literally mow it in April, not May. Um, and once I think you put it in those terms, I, I do think that helps. Another thing that really was awesome for us is that we were able to use, um, some of our own sort of volunteer network. We have had like uh, the Piedmont um, Bird Club out to, uh, you know, do a bird walk on the farm. And so then when the survey came around, I was able to reach out to that network and we were able to get some volunteers who really knew the farm. And that's important, I think, when you're talking to landowners because you're allowing like access onto these private properties maybe there's livestock, maybe there's electric fencing and gates that need to be closed or like specific directions to get to different areas without disturbing things. And so um, that was a really nice component that I had a high level of confidence that the volunteers had, were, had familiarity with the farm and we could trust them to kind of do that on their own without supervision. So okay, we've um, got some questions here. Uh, yeah. Peggy, um, go ahead, Lonnie. Okay. Yeah. So this is Lonnie Murray. And um, in my other hat, I, I'm a director on the Thomas Jefferson Soil Water Conservation District. So we work closely with NRCS and other organizations to implement best management practices. And indeed, I was also one of the directors that um, helped start um, that played, I played a role in the creation of the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program as well, which does the same thing, but for homeowners um, as some of these programs do. Um, some things that I've noticed, um, first, some policy things um, the county could probably do better. There's a lot of concern of landowners that if they enroll in EQIP for pollinator habitat or some of these programs, they'll lose land use. If the, if the assessor drives by and sees land that's not in in, in production. And so one comment I'd have for Liz is I know that this has been something that, you know, this committee has asked of the Board of Supervisors for a long time is to clarify that policy to make sure there's someone has signed up for an NRCS program that they would not lose land use. Um, so that, that's one important thing. Picture this in terms of we have so many properties in hay, um, you know, and some of them not even very productive hay. How can we encourage more people to sign up for some of these NRCS programs? I don't know if Liz, you'd want to comment on that. I'd love to comment on this. Um, what we need, and as I'm listening to this wonderful talk, thank you very much. 
um, is criteria for open space. And, um, and the county doesn't have that. I don't know if this committee has worked on that at all, much to my frustration. We have kicked people out of the land use program, um, even though they've done beautiful meadows and spent several years trying to put them uh, uh, in, in good order um, because maybe they don't have any um, division rights, whatever. Uh, and so we really need those criteria. Uh, it's a complicated system and I'm not gonna go down that route of agricultural forestal districts and all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, it, it's a complicated system, but what we need is criteria and best management practice for open space. Um, and I would love it if um, this committee could be, if they're not already looking at this um, with the help of, um, of this organization, I think that that probably could be done. Thanks, Liz. Um, there's another question I had too, which is, you know, I. I've also, um, I know a lot of the people from the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. I assume you guys work with them. Um, they're great people. Um, one of the big things as people are putting together the Chesapeake Bay model for Virginia, you know, a lot of big conservation decisions are based upon the Bay model. And yet when you look at the Bay model, it treats all grasslands the same. They're all treated like lawn is treated the same thing as warm season native grasslands. And so, you know, a system that's actually reducing nutrients, like helping protect the bay, is treated the same thing as a pollutant. And so that really distorts a lot of conservation decisions in Virginia. And I was wondering what could be done to improve those, that mapping of grasslands. I feel like there's some better, with the satellite imagery that's out and the ability of um, some of the new technologies to analyze vegetation, that we could really get some better mapping out there for, for native grasslands. Yeah, um, I, I can address that a little bit. I, I really wanted to attend this meeting where we could comment on that model. Um, I wasn't able to be there, but I know Celia Vucolo attended from Piedmont Environmental Council and, and raised that concern as well, because from all of our work, we know that these native grasslands are incredibly valuable, not only for wildlife and you know pollinator habitat, and all of those things, but also for soil health, for water filtration, um, and prevent, preventing soil erosion, all of these things. But there really doesn't seem to be any interest in including grasslands in that model at this time from that group. Um, and so something that Piedmont Environmental Council has been working on is, is how to um, get them to pay more attention to these. And I think part of that will be creating the research that demonstrates how warm season grasses can help support um, water quality. And there isn't actually a lot out there right now in Eastern grasslands. You know, we've talked a lot about this with friends of the Rappahannock who are trying to come up with ways to promote more warm season grass plantings and buffers. Um, but it's difficult for them to find funding for that versus trees because there isn't really that research out there that is demonstrating uh, water quality improvement from, from warm season grasses. So that's something we've been talking about for a while and how to go about um, doing a study that can demonstrate that has been you know, on our docket. Uh, but you know, I'd love to hear others' thoughts on that. Maybe Charlotte has some more to say or, or others on this meeting. Well, I had a comment uh, too, um, you know, a lot of people know where I, I work at Monticello, but uh, um, I think this, the, the Smithsonian um, Virginia Working uh, Landscapes Group came out and did a survey with some bird club people from, uh, from the uh, bird club, the area, the Piedmont Bird Club. They just did a couple of surveys. There are metal arts there, but the problem I'm having is, I mean, it would be great if you could give this what the program you just gave to us, Amy, for people at Monticello that um, are involved with maintaining the, the especially the, the meadows and their fields at Tufton Farm, because 
it, they're really a wreck right now. I mean, they, they've had a lot of beef cattle grazing around on them and they've just uh, tore it up and they just can't seem to get the mowing, the idea about delayed mowing and then not mowing, you know, like in the fall and everything was mowed in the fall after the, the fields have gotten so poor that they're just filled with, with Canada thistle, which was, um, it was really messy and a lot of, um, and there's a lot of the um, wingstem sunflower, which is native, but it's, it's very aggressive. And, and so people are just not happy with what it looks like. So then they end up mowing it in the fall. And I mean, there are meadow larks, quite a lot of meadow larks out there. They're trying to hang on and also grasshopper sparrows. There used to be Bob White and they, uh, I've never seen them in about 10 years now, but um, it, it's just really been frustrating for me because I've worked there for many years and I know all this I've, about the birds and everything. And I'm just running into a lot of resistance. People just aren't really, I can't seem to turn their minds into what this could be. You know, it could be a wonderful place. But. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good to see you here. Um, I, we've worked quite a bit with Keith Nevison, who is at you know, Huffington Keith Farm. Keith is no longer there. Have you heard about that? Yeah, yeah, uh, I heard that he was yeah. leaving, which is such a shame because he was yeah. he was coming to a lot of our workshops. Uh, yeah, you know, with the goal of bringing yeah. this, this yeah. back to Monticello. Um, mm -hmm. So we were supposed to do a, a bee friendly beef project there this upcoming year. Um, that Keith was going to be a part of, or he was going to be overseeing at the farm where we would, we were, we were actually going to be enhancing some of those pastures with wildflowers as a way to study how we can combine pollinator conservation with grazing. Um, but it, unfortunately with Keith's departure, um, they, they said they just didn't have the capacity to, to do that this year. Um, so maybe in the future, I mean, who who is they that um, didn't have the capacity? Because I mean, well, is it money that we have to put out money to do this or something? Or is that the problem? Um, no, no, no. I, I mean, I, we can talk about it. we can talk about it offline. I mean, I think that they're open. Oh, oh. Get my email. Yeah, I think they're open. Yeah. I think they're open to participating in research for sure. But it was just with with Keith not being able to oversee the project. We. Um, weren't able to move forward this year, but they they do seem really open to collaborate on other studies. Um, well, so let's that's good we can know. talk offline then. That would be good. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll be with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. I just want to also. I was wondering if uh, Maggie or Rod or Nicola, you guys, if you had a question, because I thought I saw a hand up from. Uh, our attendees, but maybe, maybe not. Um, I, this is Lonnie, I have one other comment. Um, one of the things about rotational grazing, um, mm -hmm. what really convinced me about the value of rotational grazing was with the conservation district, we did a tour of a farm and the, the landowner was talking about how the moment he, you know, after he introduced mob grazing on his farm, that while he wasn't a, you know, a botanist or a biologist, he felt like there are more wildflowers and more birds. And as he was talking about this and the distance, we started hearing Bob White quails singing. And, and that was the moment that I was really convinced that that, that was such a great practice. But... That that is so rewarding. I love yeah. it when I love it when the Bob Whites come in and say like, "Thank you, good job." <laughs> I'll just add one one quick comment. Um, you know, something that you know, one of our goals with the research that we're doing is to try and find management strategies that benefit. The, the biodiversity, the wildlife, but also that work for the landowners. And so that, because it is really challenging. I mean, if you have a field full of Canada thistle, you know, you, you wanna mow that when, when you can mow it um, because you don't want that spreading. Um, so, you know, or hay timing. I mean, some of the peak timing for haying is right when the birds are nesting in the fields. Um, so, so we're really trying to come up with um, research that can demonstrate or come up with solutions that can work for the farmers and work for the landowners and give them incentives to do 
to do the timing, you know, the management timing that actually benefits the birds as well. So that is the challenge. I mean, that's, of course, that's always the challenge with all conservation projects and, and issues. But, um, but the more we work with landowners and the more we get feedback on the ground about, you know, what, what the challenges are, you know, why do I have to do stuff at a certain timing? You know, what am I seeing on the ground? Um, what are the challenges that I'm facing? That really helps us to structure research um, because it's great to say, you know, you need to do this, 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 and this for the Bob White quail, but how realistic is that? And so, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that we're always, you know, always looking for feedback um, from landowners and from farmers and to contribute to developing our research projects because we want it to work for everyone, really. Because then people will be excited to do it or it will just be the natural thing to mow at a certain time um, and then benefits the birds as well. Have, I just wondering if you have found, you do have examples of uh, hay farmers that have been able to do that balance of uh, changes changing the mowing schedule, but still being able to harvest their crop. Like, um, yeah, I can I can speak to that. I mean, we have some examples of for some properties or landowners that have someone else coming to cut their hay. One thing that has worked for them is, you know, it depends on the schedule of the, the farmer who's, who's cutting the hay. Some of these landowners will just say, you know, well, do us last, just, just put us last on the docket. And so the farmer is still able to take hay off, but they're leaving that field until last. And so hopefully the majority of the birds will have gotten at least one clutch off by the time the field is hayed. So that works for some people who lease out their fields to, to hay farmers. Um, we do work with some hay farmers that are also altering the timing of haying. So for example, they'll do a really early cut um, for their first cut of hay. So maybe like last year, they were doing their first cuts around May 15th. Now, of course, that's entirely weather dependent. Um, that first cut will, it will destroy some nests of the birds that are nesting early. But what also works with that is sometimes it's, it's early enough that the birds will re-nest as that field grows back. And so what these farmers are doing is taking an early cutoff and then they'll hold off for their next hay date for say 45 days or so. Um, and then that's leaving a pretty nice window for birds to have a second chance at a nesting opportunity. And then the farmers are still getting that first cut off. So that's actually one of the treatments we're looking at for our research project to see how successful these birds are once they're re-nesting after a first cut has been taken off. Um, and another thing we're, we're working with some, a, a very small portion of our landowners to do is just to document the difference in, in profitability. So when they hay, say at the regular time, you know, Labor Day weekend is a really popular time for a first hay. Um, what if they delay till say June 15th? Uh, what are they able to sell that hay at? Um, how are, or, yeah, how much can they sell that hay for? And what's the difference? So how much are they out as far as income by just delaying it by a couple of weeks? That's a brand new thing we're kind of just, we were informally doing last year and we're gonna ask more of our, our partnering producers to do that this year um, because that will help us develop incentives so, okay, if you're selling your hay bales for $2 less, maybe we can find a pot of money to reimburse you for those, those lost, um, that lost income. And, and then we're able to, to allow some of these birds to nest successfully. Um, but it's a good question. And it's a difficult one because, you know, everyone, um, yeah, I mean, when hay is your main source of income, you need to, you need to mow when, when the hay is peaking. So. Like Charlotte said, we're, we're trying to work with the, the farmers to, to see what works for them in addition to the wildlife. I find that the other issue seems to be um, people's ascetic about how, what, like wanting a sense of order. And like Michelle was talking about, like leaving some of, along the fence lines and letting them go and reducing mowing and just, how to, how do you get people to see <laughs> the, 
beauty in the what they would think of as disorder perhaps and yeah that I think uh, that's a great question and I think that people like Michelle are great for this sort of thing so um, like Michelle we've seen other farms this year I think with COVID um, really getting a lot more local business so they've been able to increase their local markets because consumers are wanting to support their local farms. They're wanting to buy directly from the farm. And when the farms have these social media accounts like Michelle was talking about, and they're talking about the importance of, of combining biodiversity with agriculture, it's, it's changing people's minds and it's making them look at these you know, messy areas as beautiful and as opportunities for conservation. And and not necessarily a weed meadow. So I think as much as we can have farmers doing that sort of thing, it helps the cause and it educates the people who are driving by or visiting the farm. Um, and then public places like Monticello, you know, putting up a sign saying, you know, this is a, a wildlife area. This is supporting this many species. Um, I think there's a lot of great opportunity with public facing properties. To, to put up signage and educate people who are visiting or driving by about what different habitats might look like. Yeah, I think, I think just to reiterate, I mean, I think messaging is really the most important thing there. And, you know, we've tried to share different things on social media. And um, actually one of the things we shared this winter was just a side by side, there, on one side of the fence, the meadow had been mowed before the winter time and the other side, the meadow was tall. And that, that post got more, more interest than probably any of our other posts. Um, so there is, I think there is more people share that type of information. I mean, really, you know, the sound of birds, you know, waking up in a meadow is beautiful. And so, so maybe that's the beauty of that meadow, even if you think it looks like weeds, you know? So trying to, yeah, I guess just, it's just the more we can all share, um, why we're so inspired by by these meadows and why we're why we find them beautiful um hopefully you know that can spread and sort of you know yeah it's really beautiful when you hear a whole um meadow full of, of meadow larks singing and um it's a wonderful experience yeah <laughs> one positive thing I'm I was going to say one positive thing on the horizon is that the um, there's a lot of um, some bills moving forward in the General Assembly in terms of climate change, and there's there's a good possibility that um, agriculture will be included there in terms of healthy soils, and so I, I'm hoping that practices like this with warm season grasses can definitely be another aspect of this in terms of climate change and those those bills are in the uh, Virginia Assembly right now. Yeah. And well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, you know, we, we want, we're in the business of trying to promote biodiversity and doing what we can and trying to help educate our landowners. And so, um, so glad that we have this model that we can follow that you're collecting the, the data and the information to help support some of these practices. And, uh, but we'd love to hear from you what we could do, um, you know, to continue to promote this. And uh, Michelle, maybe we can uh, get some farm tours out to Bel, Bel Air, you know, at some time in the future to, and use it as sort of a demonstration farm in Almora County. Yeah, absolutely. We we love hosting, especially for folks who are kind of can take care of themselves. As long as I don't have labor dollars flowing <laughs> that direction, it's all good. We can do we can do anything like that. We have um, a big facility and plenty of room for parking and a big capacity for stuff like that. That sounds great. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's one of the things that honestly works best is getting people together and, and getting each other inspired in person at a demonstration site. I mean, I, Charlotte will say this too. I think that the most impact we have is when we bring landowners 
together and just give them the opportunity to talk and share knowledge. So now, I mean, before COVID hit, we started hosting these landowner gatherings where we would facilitate. Um, but what we did is we'd ask one of our landowners to host um, and they pick a topic of their choice. We visit their farm and it's a gathering of maybe 15, 20 people. And the landowner tours us around and maybe they talk about rotational grazing systems or they talk about pollinator gardens or they talk about riparian buffers. And then all the landowners walk around and exchange information, ask questions. And then we're literally there as just a resource. If they, if they have questions about the research that supports these practices, we can answer that. But I mean, we're finding that people are taking so much home from these conversations with one another and with like-minded individuals. So I think, you know, after COVID subsides, one of the best things you can do is um, to bring landowners together and, and have ambassador landowners that can help lead the conversation and inspire others like Michelle, who are working on farms and yet integrating all of this biodiversity conservation on a daily basis, I think is really inspiring. Agreed. Well, if are there any other questions that, uh, oh, Michael, yes. Yeah, just, just one quick point along that way. Um, uh, landowners are usually very interested in what other landowners are doing. And I, I remember, um, you know, going down rural roads and looking at the DeKalb corn variety signs that people would have posted so that, I mean, obviously it was promotional for DeKalb or, you know, whatever, whatever seed you were growing, but partly it was so that other farmers could kind of see, well, how, how's that crop doing? And it seems to me it'd be a great idea for you guys also to develop some signage that you could actually put outside of somebody's farm doing this sort of thing so that other farmers and other uh, landowners could could see uh, oh yeah they're doing some something interesting over there I kind of keep an eye on that yeah that's um it's a great idea Michael and it's on my grant list it's on my grant list for signage <laughs> all right well um is there anyone else that has a question? or a comment. All right. Well, if not, uh, thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk to us. And we are really excited to partner with you and hope to continue these conversations in the future. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it and very excited about the work you're doing. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you for the invite. And, and yeah, hopefully someday we'll see you all in person, you know, for a walk or something. Yeah, agreed. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And it, Michelle, it was so nice to hear from one of our participating properties how you're using the data and how it's helping to change minds. So, you know, I've, I'm also just really inspired to have all of these questions and to hear from Michelle. And as Charlotte said, I, I look forward to when we can hold gatherings again, because we'd love to do some gatherings in Albemarle County and, and get folks together and, and have more of these discussions in person. So we'll look forward to keeping in touch. All right, sounds great. Thanks everyone for having me. And um, yeah, the offer to come to Bel Air is always open. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you so much and have a great evening. All right, good night everybody. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that was uh, inspiring and uh, hopefully we can continue to follow their great work that they're doing. And I just love this possibility of model of, um, you know, showcasing. I love this landowner ambassador. Did you, how did you arrange to have the, did you just send her an email and say you'd like to do a little PowerPoint? Well, uh, Kim reached out, our wonderful Kim, <laughs> oh, Kim. reached, reached out and uh, okay. I just, and I live really close to Bel Air Farm, so I know Michelle, and um, so I knew that they had been working over there uh, together, so, and Michelle's a big birder, so 
and she had told me about some of the changes that they had done over there and really seen some great results. Well, it's great they've got Bob White. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and, I'd love to have, the, have that presentation, you know, for some folks at Monticello. I'm glad, you know, Keith was working toward that, but I'm not sure how much he, how far he got before everything kind of turned upside down. So, but I think, do you know he's at Bundoran? No. We aren't, isn't that a property we, we kind of keep an eye on? I wonder if he'll be doing some of the same well, thing. I, I think so. I think he wants to. Yeah. So that but, would be a good thing. Yeah. I think what yeah. uh, Amy said about this idea of having these demonstration sites and that are really public, like Monticello, makes a lot of sense. Where you've got people coming in, they're like, well, if they're doing it at Monticello, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, and also, you know, the importance of doing it on our county uh, land properties, lands as well. And that just, uh, brings up, I just want to let you guys know that I'm going to be meeting with uh, Jim Barber next week, and we're going to uh, take a look at the power line uh, right away that goes through Darden Tau Park and at, look at the possibility of changing the mowing schedule on that. And of course, that is all uh, cool weather like fescue. So it makes me like, what do you, what happens when you don't mow that? Like, and how will the warm weather grasses come in? So now I have a bunch of questions in my own mind about. Uh, it it doesn't something? always. It's always. It's not always pretty when you know, when you stop mowing. That's the that's the problem. You have to. You either have to seed it or you know get rid of the fescue and put uh, seed it. You know with with better plants and warm season grasses or, it, it's not it's not easy to bring nature back. I think Lonnie has, a, Lonnie has a question though. Yeah, a yeah, um, couple of things. Um, you know, actually you mentioned Bundor and I just want to say that's where Cactus Rock is. So there is one of our sites there at Bundor. I thought so. Um, yeah, yeah um, sad to see that you guys lost Keith though. Yeah, um, it's, it's, it was devastating. It was, uh, I um, guess, one of the COVID uh, casualties. Oh, uh, sorry to hear I, that. I did, I did want to say for the, um, for the um, for the policy committee, I, I definitely think we should add that onto the um, what we we're talking about with Liz. I think we need to add that onto the policy committee agenda. I come very close to to some language, and it just never went anywhere. So maybe I can revise the the work that I already did on that issue, and the committee can discuss it, put together a recommendation for for properties. Um, the General Assembly pushed this along too. They changed the, the language of the land use regulations themselves to include properties involved in a soil or water conservation practice. And, um, and so it's clear the General Assembly also wanted to see these properties included in land use. Um, so. Can I uh, say something real quick? On that? Oh, you, oh you, I thought you were frozen. Yes. <laughs> oh, um, I, I just want to say um, I have some very, very confusing email exchanges with Greg Kampner, the county attorney, on exactly what we need. And so before you um, start uh, doing that, you may want to, um, uh, Kim obviously could do that or check with uh, uh, Scott Clark and Greg Kampner, just to make sure that um, we're getting what uh, you're working on exactly what we need. I still am a, a little bit confused on the specifics of, of what's needed. So from my perspective, just real quickly, um, and I know this meeting has gone on for a while, but for people that are enrolled in these practices, I, I think you know NRCS has said that they'd be willing to sign a letter, say yes, this person is still engaged in this practice, um, which from the language of the, the General Assembly has, that says to me that they qualify not only for open space, but they would also qualify for agriculture uh, land use. Um, but there are other, other piece of this is too, is that also the conservation district has said, we'd be willing to certify people too, that if someone is not within the lifespan of a project, but they wanna say, 
come out and say, yes, this is a qualifying conservation practice that, that we'd be willing to do that as well. We might charge them a fee for doing so, but um, for staff time, but I think that's, that, that to me is the way to solve this is to just have someone document the conservation practice they're engaged in. And, and that meets what I would say is my understanding of the, the Virginia code as it's currently written. And, um, and so that's, that's the kind of recommendation that I would put forward. If you, if you look in the, the county, if you look in the, the Virginia code, there is specific language for soil and water conservation um, and land use. Well, I think that would be great for uh, the policy, policy group to continue to pursue that. And, um, and we are gonna, just a reminder that uh, hopefully Scott Clark will be joining us at our next meeting. And I did create that document uh, where I would really love it if people would just go ahead and put some of their questions into it so that everybody can look at that. I mean, I tried to start it with some of the questions that came up during our last meeting, but if everybody, and then that way we can actually give uh, Scott those questions ahead of time. So he has a little bit of an idea about uh, what we're interested in. But yeah, I think it's, I think that would be a great thing to, to look at. We should add that topic to the list while we have him to ask yes, questions about it. Absolutely. So we have, um, we only have just a few more minutes. <laughs> Is there anything that, uh, that you guys want to add? I had a couple little things to report on, but is there anybody else who has something that they want to report on? I'll just say that I did talk to Ruth Douglas, um, sent her an email about visiting one of our sites. And so she seems to be game with that. Um, so I'll be going out in the spring. Um, you know, we've got both our vaccines to go see. Um, I want to go see the climbing fern. I've never seen that before. Um, but see what other interesting places that maybe maybe Ruth and the and the other other volunteers are are doing. Great. Well, I had. Oh yes, go ahead. Uh, is it Rod or Maggie? Yeah, it's it's right. I just I'll just mention one thing that uh, not to change the topic or anything. I don't know if you're all aware of HJ 527, which was a bill that made it through the state legislature. It's awaiting the governor's signature, uh, and this directs VDAX and DCR to form a working group to look at the options uh, for taking invasive plants out of the trade. Uh, so yeah, the PRISM should be one of the, the, the members of that working group, and we are one of the five organizations that, that put that together and shepherded it through. Uh, so just, just, just so you're aware that that's, that's lurking out there. But that's really great to hear. I, it was interesting because I had joined the VCN uh, Conservation Lobby Day, and I forget who I was talking to. I think it was the uh, Deeds, Pre-Deeds Legislative Aid. And, is like we are getting a lot of uh, a lot of feedback about that bill. You know, a lot of people are tuned into invasive plants, and they wanted to see something done about them, done about it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're creating a lot of visibility, and uh, ho hopefully, we can keep it up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was a question about it at that at the Bird Club meeting last night, um, and a number of years ago, uh, before you joined the Natural Heritage Committee, we. We had a meeting out at the Emerald County uh, uh, office building with um, for uh, a nurse trying to urge them to sell invasive plants. And we, it, it was a number of years ago we had this, but it was it was a good um, discussion, you know, garden centers like you know snows and places like that. Oh, that's that's great. Well, so, what yeah. was the bill number again? HJ 527. Thank you. Well, thank you for your great work uh, with the uh, Blue Ridge Prism and all the effort and all your great uh, educational work um, that you guys are doing. It's so exciting. 
And um, I had the pleasure of going to Nicola's uh, farm today because I'm working on getting my uh, pesticide technician applicator license and she is helping me out there. And so I learned uh, just a ton today and uh, really excited about, I've been working with um, the Nature Conservancy as an AmeriCorps volunteer, I think I had mentioned this, and they're doing some invasive work days. And so I've been participating in that and um, really want to try to hopefully push that we can get a work day in one of our Alma County parks uh, and, and get that moving forward. And also uh, the Piedmont Master Gardeners and working with the Piedmont Environmental Council, we're hoping to um, do a program where we're actually going to the nurseries and um, providing, you know, maybe some labels for the native plants and doing some of that work that we had talked about before, um, really doing some education and outreach to the our local nurseries. You're here, thank you. So, hooray. Yay, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, we are, where are we? We are at 728. And so we just wanna make sure we end the meeting on time. Yes, Bruce. Uh, the wet weather is perfect for pulling up uh, non-natives. I've been able to pull things out of the ground that in July or August would be impossible. They just pull right out. I just have to be careful not to slip and fall. But so get to work, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Get to work. Can I ask a quick question before everybody hangs up? Does anybody know of a good person that puts up deer fence? Good deer fence. Mm -hmm. If you do, would you email me? <laughs> Let me know. Yeah. We, had the, we had the, we had a two miles put in at Monticello, but it's it's the same people that put in the the deer fence along um, sixty four. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll email you and see if I can get you that. Yeah because I, 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 I have know. desperate need. All right, <laughs> thanks. Mm -hmm. Good well, thank you all. Um, I thought it was really a great meeting, very informative, and um, I wish you guys a beautiful March, and we will look forward to seeing you again in April. And when uh, Kim sends out the information about our working groups, uh, hopefully we can get together and make progress on our subtopics. All right. Thank you so much to our guests. And thank you, Carolyn, for being our host. All right. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye. Bye. <clears throat>